Okay, so um, welcome everyone to um, this Hype Society event. Um, I'm going to be chairing it, uh, rather than some LSE academic who will want to be doing that. Uh, and so just by means of introduction, um, we have Sean Gabb with us today, um, who is um, a writer, lecturer and broadcaster and director of the Libertarian Alliance. Um, and so, as you know, Hype Society, we uh, try and keep good links with various libertarian organisations. Uh, we've got something planned with the Institute of Economic Affairs in a few weeks' time, so we'll be hearing about that. Um, so it's good to add the, add the LA to the, to the list. Um, now, uh, Sean, is, um, he's spoken and written on a number of topics, um, such as gay marriage, uh, legalisation of drugs, and of course, um, freedom of speech, which I'll be speaking on today. So. Without further ado, um, please take the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for your introduction, and uh, thank you for having had the goodness to invite me to address the Hayek Society, for which I've always had the highest regard, and many thanks for many thanks to the audience for having come out. Um, on an evening when apparently the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer is speaking at the LSE. I am very honoured that you think me more worthy of your attention. Now, 35 years ago, when I was your age as an undergraduate, my university or my students' union had a no-platform policy in which persons who held disagreeable views were prevented, so far as possible, from speaking on campus and certainly were prevented from speaking to any organisation that was connected with the Students' Union. Nowadays, I can see that we have progressed a long way from that no-platform policy insofar as I come before you without any particularly disagreeable views on the moral or intellectual fitness of certain human groups or the propriety or advisability of certain lifestyles. I am simply here to argue that there should be no controls, there should be no legal controls on the expression of such opinions and even so it has been thought necessary for a member of staff to sit in on this meeting with no sinister intent I'm sure um, simply to make sure that I do not say anything untoward. Uh, and there was even some vague talk uh, about a disruption of the meeting. And, and so when I was your age 35 years ago, I, I naively thought that we were, broadly speaking, going in the right direction. Um, today I can see that uh, whatever progress there has been, has, in, has been in quite the wrong direction. With that, with that introduction, let me begin. When I say that I believe in freedom of speech, I, I think I should define my terms. I, I believe that uh, we have the right to say anything that, that is not in breach of some private right and um, does not tend towards the dissolution or overthrow of the country of which we are a citizen. Let me explain. I have no right to publish your private revelation to me of some personal unfitness. That would be a breach of confidence. I have no right to pass off an essay of yours that you show me as my own work. That would be a breach of your intellectual property. I have no right to tell the world that treasure beyond counting is buried six feet below your flower beds. That would be libel, perhaps, or slander, or malicious falsehood. Equally, I have no right um, to tell the world where our trident submarines are located. If we are at war, I have no right to reveal to the world such knowledge as I may have of where our next big push will be. I have no right, um, if there is a reasonable prospect of war, to reveal what might be regarded as important military secrets to a foreign enemy. 
I accept that all of these restrictions on freedom of speech have been used as excuses to cover up various kinds of wrongdoing. And certainly where any law regarding state security is concerned, the law must be very tightly drafted and must be continuously policed because that is the main source of trouble when it comes to restrictions on freedom of speech from central government. But so long as such laws are used only for their stated purpose, although I may disagree with the details of them, although I might wish there to be a, a much more liberal um, law of libel, but we do have a pretty liberal one at the moment, I, I see no reason to complain that we live in a regime of censorship. So long as those exceptions are there to cover only the reasons used for their justification, I, I do not see any reason to complain unduly. Beyond that, however, everything else is fair game. Anything that is in the public domain is fair game for comment, one way or the other. There should be no legal restrictions. Nobody should be sent to prison for voicing a disagreeable opinion. Nobody should be sent to prison, nobody should be punished in any administrative sense for saying anything that happens to offend a person or a group or any kind of interest. But that is a reasonable working definition of freedom of speech. Not a radical definition, I will agree, but it is a working definition. Why do I think that freedom of speech is so important? I, I could go into a long exposition of the non-aggression principle or talk about our inalienable human right or our inalienable right to speak our minds or use our property as we will, but um, I, I might just as easily talk about how God wants us to be free. If you don't believe in God, what I'm saying is effectively a verbal burp, and if you don't believe in inalienable rights, what, what I am saying w will not really carry much weight. And, and so let us leave aside any questions of your absolute inalienable right to freedom of expression. Let, let us take a, a utilitarian approach to it. And one reason why freedom of speech is so important is that without freedom of speech, it, it, it is very hard to say that you know anything with reasonable surety outside your own limited sphere of inquiry. But let me begin um, with a useful and perhaps a neutral example. I believe that between 1917 and 1991, the Soviet state murdered around 30 million people. It murdered some of those people by shooting and hanging, and some of those people by deliberately engineered um, famines. It, it murdered them in various ways, but it brought about the deaths of around 30 million people. I believe this with reasonable surety. But how do I know that it happened? I wasn't there. So far as I can tell, the the greatest volume of killings ended before I was born. I, I've never been there. I, if I had been to Russia, I wouldn't have seen any of the killings. How do I know that happened? I could look at the primary sources. I, I could look at the KGB archives, which were opened for quite a long period and which remain reasonably open to inquirers. But the point is I don't speak any Russian. And I'm not, although I deplore the violence of the Soviet state, I, I'm not enormously interested to learn about its details. And so I don't speak Russian, and I don't want to read any of those primary sources which may have been translated into English. Indeed, um, although I don't speak any Russian, 
I am reasonably competent in Greek and Latin. And I can tell you from my own expertise that for the past 300 years, translations into English from Greek and Latin have systematically ignored the rather holistic attitude that the ancients took to sexuality and have completely overlooked the strong partiality of both the Greeks and the Romans to mood altering substances. If you change just, if you, if you choose one translation of a word over another translation of a word, you can change the entire meaning of a whole passage. And if you can do that in Greek and Latin, you can do it in Russian. And so even if I were inclined to go looking at the translations of primary sources, I would have no surety that I was uh, reading the truth. The reason I believe that the murders of 30 million people by the Soviet state took place is because I read it in a book. And I believe what I read in that book or those books purely on authority. I am not able or inclined to go behind those authorities and look at any kind of primary evidence, partly because I don't want to, but partly because I can't. There is no shame in saying that I believe this authority because most of the things I know, in quotation marks, I believe on authority. I believe that the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. I believe that because when I was younger, I read it in a book about astronomy. For all I know, the speed of light might be infinite, or it might be 10 miles a second. I wouldn't notice the difference. I don't know how to measure the speed of light, and if I were told how to measure the speed of light, I wouldn't know how to use the necessary instrumentation. And if I did try to measure the instrumentation, I have no doubt that I would reach results so widely at variance that they became worthless. I, I don't know how to prove that the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. I believe it on authority. I believe that the Earth is an oblate sphere that rotates on its axis once every 24 hours. Now, I'm willing to accept the evidence of my uninstructed senses that the world appears to be a sphere. Rotating on its axis, I've never seen that. As far as I can see, everything is moving around the stationary Earth. And as for the flattening of the poles, search me, I wouldn't know how to prove that. And although I've said that the world appears to be a sphere, you put me up against a skilled and intelligent flat earther, and I would look like a right idiot in under five minutes. I do not know how to show, I do not know how to demonstrate that the earth is not flat, or at least I do not know how to demonstrate that the earth is not a sphere. And I could go through a whole list of things that I believe, but which I'm unable to demonstrate. I simply take on authority. And as I said, there is no shame in this. Of course, you should be careful not to accept too many things on authority when they are in your own sphere of interest. But for the most part, indeed, for the overwhelming bulk of the things you know, you take it on authority. And even if, uh, to go back to the speed of light, even if you are able or inclined to look, to look behind the claim of a certain speed, there's only so far back you will go. You will still reach a point, probably, where you are taking statements on authority. Let me return to the murderous activities of the Soviet state. What reason have I for believing that these things happened? The answer is that I am taking on authority a consensus among scholarly opinion which is openly reached and openly maintained. It is possible it is legally possible, and it is in fact possible, for anybody to stand up and say, no, 
the Soviet state did not murder 30 million people. Indeed, Christopher Hill, a rather distinguished, though perhaps eccentric, historian of, uh, of 17th century England, maintained to the end of his life that this was simply propaganda put out by the Western powers to besmirch the noble socialist experiment of the Soviet Union, and that there were no killings. Uh, Eric Hobsbawm, an even more distinguished historian, though in my opinion a rather eccentric one, did not deny that there had been somewhat unpleasant activities within the Soviet Union, but always maintained that they were greatly exaggerated by Western propaganda. Barbara Castle, not a communist, in, indeed a Labour politician, and in the 1960s a Labour cabinet minister, was in Moscow in the late 1930s, and she maintained until her dying day that she did not see any evidence in Soviet Russia of the terror that we read about in history books. And so not only is it legally possible for anyone to challenge the scholarly consensus of a murderous Soviet state, but it has been done. I've given you three examples. And so this is a consensus openly reached and openly maintained and openly challenged, which still stands up. And for that reason, I am willing, as somebody who is unable or unwilling to look at the sources for himself, to accept the claim that the Soviet state murdered all those millions of people. If, on the other hand, it were to become an article of faith, breach of which was attended by imprisonment or loss of employment or expulsion from a place of learning, to uphold the truth of the murderous activities of the Soviet state, then I would feel much less confident than I presently am in maintaining that those murders took place. It may of course be that um, my confidence would be unshaken. After all, we have had a very long period during which the debate over the Soviet state has taken place, and opinion has been entirely free on this issue so far, and it is very unlikely that in the future there will be compelling new evidence discovered either way that adds to anything that is presently the consensus. It may well be that the truth is reasonably well known that the Soviet state did kill all those millions of people, may kill a few million more, a few million less, but um, the Soviet state was not a nice institution in the 20th century, and it may be that there will be no new evidence discovered to shake or to confirm that judgment, and so if it were to become illegal to discuss these murders now, it might be that my confidence in the statements I read in the history books would be unaffected. On the other hand, there would be people standing up and saying, what kind of truth is this that needs laws to defend it? If it's true, why can't it be denied? And so, to make it a criminal offence, or even to make it in administrative terms unwise to discuss certain issues, is to shake our confidence in the truth in those areas. And the greater the degree of censorship, the less certain can be the faith we have in any particular scholarly consensus. If there were anybody in this audience at the moment who was strongly in favour of censorship, the answer I would have is, oh come on Sean, we're not talking about shutting down debate on scientific or historical topics. We're talking about hate speech, the kind of hate that blasts people's lives, the kind of hate that whips up mobs to murderous frenzies. That's what we're talking about. Well, I don't think that is the case. So far as I can tell, the main arguments for censorship, certainly within universities at the moment, the main argument for censorship 
is to shut down debate on the allegedly differential moral and intellectual policies of certain groups, or about the rightness or advisability of certain lifestyles. And although you may find certain claims made in one direction or the other about these issues to be disagreeable, it remains true that there is no formal difference between claims about these issues and claims about what happened in the Soviet Union or any claims about the speed of light. The arguments are still expressed in terms of propositions which are supported with various kinds of evidence. If I go further on that. When people talk about hate speech, the, the idea that pops into my mind, and the idea that may be intended to pop into my mind and your mind, is the idea of somebody turning up outside a chess club, for example. You turn up outside a chess club at the head of a mob, and you make a speech in the following terms. There are children, there are kidnapped children inside that chess club, inside that building at the moment. Little boys and girls as young as two, they're being tortured. And in a minute they'll be raped and murdered and their bodies will be eaten. And so we must take action now. We must stop these evil people from killing those little children as young as two. Well, if you do make such a speech, and there is a breach of the peace, then it is quite reasonable to regard you as criminally responsible, at least in part, for the damage to life and property that ensues. You have assembled people, you have, you have harangued those people out of their right minds, you have told them that, that there is an emergency, you have to some extent subordinated their will to your own and you should stand trial alongside those people. But this is not very often the case. Uh, most of the people who are proceeded against for their opinions do not turn up outside buildings in public at the head of mobs, inciting people directly to violence. Most of the people who are proceeded against for what they say have written and published something. And, and that is an entirely different situation. If you read an article, and again, I'm being extraordinarily uh, reticent about the nature of the opinions that um, are forbidden. I'm doing this for your sake as well as for mine. If you read an article which talks about the allegedly differential moral and intellectual qualities of groups of human beings. You are sitting alone in a library with a journal article in front of you or a book, or you are sitting somewhere else with uh, a website open in front of you. You are reading this by yourself Almost certainly the piece of writing before you will not tell you to go out and commit an act of violence against life or property. It'll be left to you to form your own judgment on that. You will go through some process of reflection and then you'll have to get up and go out and commit an act of violence against life or property. In such a case, your will is what the lawyers call a new intervening cause. You are fully responsible for your own actions. And whoever wrote the um, article that may have inspired you to action cannot be held in any sense legally responsible at any rate for your actions. And so the idea that um, simply making such writings available, simply allowing people to turn up and speak their minds is a direct cause of crimes against life and property is, um, is at the very least a misstatement. 
you are your own will, as I said, is a new intervening cause. And, and I go further. Um, let me be rather specific. The it is reasonable to suppose that Mein Kampf and the collected speeches of Adolf Hitler inspired the murder of between 7 and 13 million people uh, between about 1933 and 1945. It, it seems a reasonable body count. That is a deplorably high number and one can wish that Hitler had never been born or had stepped under a tram in Vienna circa 1910. But does that mean that we should ban the publication of Mein Kampf or that we should insist on its removal from every university library in the country or indeed in Europe? Perhaps we should. But if we demand the banning of Mein Kampf, why not the banning of Das Kapital or the Communist Manifesto? As I've said, um, the Marxian socialists of the 20th century murdered around 30 million people in the Soviet Union, and they murdered between 50 and 80 million people in China. And, well, you know, we're talking telephone numbers when it comes to the scale of death. Um, for every person murdered by someone inspired by Mein Kampf, you can say 5, 6, 7, 10, 12, 15 times as many murdered by somebody inspired by one of the various works of Karl Marx or Friedrich Engels. Does that mean that we should ban the works of Karl Marx from every university library in the country or in Europe or in the world, wherever we have the ability to reach out and insist on these bans? I don't hear many people answering yes to that, not simply in this room, but um, in general. It seems to be rather a selective call for censorship. And there are many feminists who insist that rape equals porn. Now, I won't get involved in that debate, but let it be, let it be supposed that certain kinds of erotic writings and images may put things into people's minds that would not otherwise have been there. Yes, it might well do. But again, if we are to ban the publication of those images and words, why do we allow people free access to the works of Karl Marx and Lenin and all the others whose works have on exactly the same grounds inspired hundreds or thousands of times more murders. I'll say again, the calls for censorship that I see do tend to be highly selective. You can extend the principle stated for censorship to cover all manner of things that are otherwise untouched. One moment, I'll pause for questions just a moment. The last point I would make and I don't wish to go on and on weaving, so I'm going to wind up now. The last point I would make is that at the moment, many people are suggesting that a university campus should be a safe space. That persons from certain minority groups, which have allegedly suffered a great deal of persecution, in the recent past, or which still suffer a certain degree of persecution, should be protected. They, they should not be required to encounter opinions or attitudes that they find disagreeable. I accept that there are many opinions, quite often rather bluntly stated, which some people find offensive, which some people find hurtful. And I sympathize with those people, I feel sorry for them. But when you ask for a university to become a safe space within which, within which people will be freed from the requirement to subject themselves to disagreeable opinions, you are arguing for something quite different from the traditional conception of a university. 
what you're arguing for is a nursery school or a seminary or some kind of monastic community. If you really are upset, if it causes spots to break out all over your face or, or if it causes you to cut pieces out of your body in the manner of the late Princess of Wales, simply because you read an argument that, um, for example, um, ah, here's one, um, because fat people allegedly break wind more often than thin people, they are contributing unacceptably to global warming. <laughs> if, this, if, if, if encountering that sort of argument court sends you into some kind of uh, meltdown, you really shouldn't be in a university. You, you have no business being in a place like the London School of Economics. Um, with all respect, and I, I, as I said, I will repeat again, some people are very upset by the things they read and hear, but um, if you're in a university, that's part of your education. And so for all of the reasons I've given, and doubtless for many reasons that I haven't given, I, I would say that um, there should be unlimited freedom of speech on all issues which are in the public domain regardless of the embarrassment or the offence that these may cause to other persons. Um, with those words, I, I, I will stop and I'll thank you for the great indulgence that you've shown me. Okay, thank you. Right, so uh, we can uh, have some questions now. Uh, I've got some, I think Amrish is particularly keen to ask a question. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, <coughs> with regard to selective censorship that you mentioned, uh, I'm guessing most people agree with your point. I agree with your point. Um, what do you think drives the selection of the things being censored? And related to that, why are so many people? blindly forward slash passively allowing such things to be censored without some sort of resistance or significant resistance. What drives what drives censorship? Well there's no overall conspiracy. There's no shadowy group of people saying we will we will stop people from talking about this so that we can carry on robbing and exploiting and murdering at will. Um, there are people who simply there are people who are unable to argue against the opinion they want to ban. Uh, and then there are other people who simply think it beneath their dignity to argue against what they would want to ban. And then there are other people who um, simply look at the precedent of one kind of banned speech and, and so expect that their own dignity as a minority group requires them to insist on censorship in their own for their own cause. I came for example for example I came across an argument a few years ago for um, hate speech against fat people to be made a criminal offence. Um, now, now there is no central organisation of fat people. It, it's just that um, if you're sick of being called or oh, you know you, you really let yourself go, haven't you? Don't have that. You know, a moment on the hip, a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. If you really get sick of hearing that, uh, you, you may look at the example, uh, of the precedent set by other groups, and say, "Well, you know, I'm sick of this. I think there should be a law against being rude to people like myself, persons of size, you know, who's um, it's, it's not my fault that I'm perhaps a little on the ample side. Uh, you know, I, I'm sick of this. I want a law against it." Why do people go along with this? Um, well, partly because it's too much trouble to stand up and say people should be allowed to say these disagreeable things because the implication will often be that you believe in those disagreeable things yourself. During the witch mania in Europe during the early late 16th and early 17th centuries, if you denied the existence of witches, uh, you 
you could often be found guilty of witchcraft yourself. And although we don't burn witches anymore, uh, people accused of heresy can be sent to prison, or at the very least they can be made untouchable in their various trades and callings. And to stand up and say that um, you know, John Smith shouldn't be put in prison for saying that, John Smith should not be kicked out of his university position for saying that, he should have the full right to freedom of speech. If you stand up and say that too loudly, there are people who say, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? He's that way inclined himself. So there is a climate of fear. Okay, Will, do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, just particularly as libertarians, how we should deal with distinctions between speech in the public sphere and a right to speech within private platforms, things like Twitter or Facebook. Because I personally would be very concerned when Twitter recently came out with a sort of trust and safety council to police the actions of its users. And there, I feel as though something wrong and illiberal was happening, in perhaps a million cents. Mm. Um, but I struggle to articulate any kind of rights claim um, that would entitle me to free speech on Twitter. And instead, I must fall back on a broader it's just healthy to let everyone express their opinions mm. um, argument. And is that the best that we can do? Or what strategy should we take there? It's, it may well be the best thing that we can do. After all, I run, you know, I, I'm the director of the Libertarian Alliance. We have a blog. We post a diversity of things on it. But, but if you were to come to me with an article explaining that um, certain events in Central Europe in the 1930s and 40s didn't happen but should have happened, my answer would be, I don't propose to touch that with a 10-foot barge pole, take it somewhere else. Mm. Um, now, you know, what we're talking about is the use of private property. And as you say, by, by extension, as you say, Twitter and Facebook are private property. And if those organizations choose not to allow certain opinions to be voiced on their own private property, who are we to speak otherwise? It's just that they are so large and they are so ubiquitous. And it does sensibly diminish the scope of free debate if certain opinions are chased from those very important public places or those very important places. Um, I suppose I could come out with a rather fanciful argument that uh, Twitter and Facebook are joint stock limited liability corporations. They are granted certain privileges by the state in that the shareholders cannot be sued for tort or they can't be chased in the event of a bankruptcy of the company itself. And in return for that, if they claim to be providing a platform for public debate, they should be required to provide a platform for public debate. But I wouldn't insist on that. I think I would agree with you that um, so far as Twitter and Facebook are constraining the bounds of debate at the moment, it is to be deplored but it is by no means um, in the same league as a criminal law against the expression of certain views. It is simply deplorable. Um, okay, yeah. Okay, so um, I've got uh, two questions. So the first one is I would just agree and thank you for everything you said about the Soviet Union because I think it's an argument that a comparison that needs to be made more often than it is when it comes to these kinds of um, Debates, but just following on from that, I just wondered if you could comment on the fact that recently in Ukraine they have made it illegal to deny the Holodomor, which is precisely the kind of uh, public ban we're mm -hmm. speaking about. And I think it's quite easy to understand the motive which drives that, um, due to the fact that uh, obviously between the relations between Ukraine and Russia right now, and given the history, um, there seems to be this kind of extreme emotional desire to do that. And I think maybe it would be interesting to hear if you have any thoughts on that. And the second thing. Um, is that I was surprised to hear you say that this kind of opprobrium is not new. This, this has happened when you were a student, and this is because I, I assumed it was a new phenomenon uh, on campuses. And uh, recently I saw that apparently there was a question put in the LCSU um, council in which somebody asked, Would the LCSU seek to ban a colour on campus if it was deemed to be yeah. um, 
offensive? And the answer, from what I understand, is yes. And so it seems to me like to maintain this kind of offence, it's an unsustainable project. But given that you suggest that this is not a new phenomenon with students, I wonder whether you think this is this is in fact a sustainable project of hysteria. Um, every so often during my life, I've said, you know, this can't carry on much longer. But um, I've reached a somewhat advanced age in life, and these things have carried on. I, I, um, H.J. Isaac, who had a number of um, disagreeable things to say about the differential moral or intellectual qualities of various groups of human beings, uh, turned up, I think, to the LSE in the late 1960s to speak about something else and was prevented by a student demonstration. And so this has been going on since my time as a student and since long before my time as a student. It has been going on now for a good half century. And uh, there is no reason to suppose that it will not continue indefinitely into the future. Um, as regards controls on freedom of speech in the Ukraine. This is a country without any particular liberal tradition. It, it is a country which is being torn apart and which has to some extent been broken apart already by a civil war. It, it is a country in which um, elected representatives get involved in fistfights on camera in the parliament building. Uh, and so if, if, if these people come out with laws to criminalise um, disagreement with the official view over events in the 1930s, I am not surprised and I'm unable to I'm unable to feel inclined to um, distinguish that law for any special condemnation. We, we're talking about the kind of state of affairs that we would never wish to come about in this country. So that's a rather um, that's a rather ambiguous answer, isn't it? It doesn't mean anything. Uh, Ukraine is a country that is falling apart. And when a country is visibly falling apart, it perhaps is unfair to single out any particular aspect of the country's dissolution. We should simply hope that it doesn't happen here. Sorry, is that a better answer? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess if there could be a kind of uh, follow-up question, it would be, do you think that it's permissible to limit free expression legislatively in special circumstances? I mean, it's hard to see why criminalizing uh, beliefs that the Holodomor was not true um, or did not occur would actually help to sustain Ukraine in its fight against Russia. But suppose it did, would you consider that a legitimate uh, restriction on expression in the same way that, for example, not revealing the location of crime subjects is possible? If you want to put it in those terms, if I were a Ukrainian patriot, and if it were reason, if I were reasonably assured that criminalizing the denial of these facts would material would materially assist my country in preserving its independence, then you would have made a persuasive case. But we're talking about um, a, a set of circumstances so contingent that it doesn't affect the generality of what I said, does it? Okay. Um, I'll call to Bill in a moment. I will ask my own question first. <laughs> I wonder if you could um, comment on the the kind of uh, just building on from Amitra's question about the, the selection of these of who to censor. Of who to censor. The NUS recently have targeted um, people like Jermaine Greer um, and Peter Tatchell, who are kind of generally seen as on the left. Mm. Um, I just wondered what you thought about that um, in terms of. What you said about how they they select who to censor based on generally based on their ideas, it seems now that that's kind of changing. Um, well, I suppose what I ought to do is have a good laugh at it. I've always regarded Jermaine Greer and Peter Tatchell as phony lefties, and, and to see uh, to see these people turning on their own might bring a rather embittered belly laugh. But the problem is. But although I've never met Jermaine Greer, I do know Peter Tatchell fairly well. 
And although I don't like his socialism, although I don't like his endorsement of anti-discrimination laws, although I, I think Peter is often rather excitable in the expression of his opinions, what I will not deny, what I will never deny, is that Peter Tatchell came out as a gay man at a time when to imply that you might be a bit that way inclined could get you a black eye. And Peter went on those marches and Peter stood up and argued for decriminalising and for lowering the, age of uh, lowering the age of consent at a time when it would get you more than the occasional funny look. He did that. And although it's very hard to it's very hard to measure cause and effect between statements and changes in the law, he did, I believe, have a measurable effect on bringing about the relatively liberal environment within which persons of diverse sexuality nowadays live. And to see people who were not even born, and sometimes whose parents had not been born at a time when Peter was going on those marches and being spat at, and being called transphobic and a racist and a bigot, strikes me as scandalous at the very least. Utterly scandalous. Um, that aside, I am told that witch hunts generally diminish in further when uh, sometimes the witch hunters themselves find themselves in the dock accused of untoward thoughts or actions. And although Peter and Germaine Greer have never been uh, witch hunters as such, I do look forward to a time when the people leading these witch hunts will themselves be hunted. And perhaps that will be the end of the madness. But as I said, this has been going on now since the late 1960s at least, and I see no reason why it shouldn't continue for a very long time to come. Okay, so how, how are you happy to turn now? It's um, <laughs> <laughs> alright, it's alright. Um, okay, um, with regards to um, organisations like ISIS, um, where would you draw the line when it comes to free speech? Would you draw the line in um, no platforming anyone who um, even sympathising with, with ISIS or putting them in prison, or would you draw the line um, when it comes to um, funding or recruiting for ISIS? I certainly would not make it any kind of criminal offence to stand up and support ISIS. If you believe that Western civilization is a disgusting swamp, and that it is the right and duty of Muslims everywhere to stand up and strike a blow against Western imperialism in the lands of Islam and in the lands of the unbeliever, then I believe you have the right to say that. And should you have the right to raise money for ISIS? Probably not, because then you could be called, you could be accused of procuring criminal acts. But should you have the right to leave this country and go and fight in Syria? Well, yes, I think you should. Um, in the 1930s, many tens of thousands of British people left this country and went to Spain to fight on both sides in the civil war in that country. And uh, they did so without breaking any law in this country and they came back and they carried on with their lives, sometimes rather troublesome lives. And if people, if British citizens want to leave this country to take part in a civil war in which our own country is not involved, mind you, then I don't see why they shouldn't. Um, perhaps they shouldn't get out to come back, but that's another matter. But certainly, uh, leaving aside participating in the Syrian civil war and leaving aside raising funds for acts of terrorism. Leaving all those things aside and simply looking at um, the right to the right to propagandize in favor of burning people to death and chopping heads off, then yes that does come within freedom of speech so long as you're not saying 
see that person there, John Smith, I believe that we should get hold of him, burn him to death. Uh, as long as you are not um, committing an assault, as it would be recognised by the common law, uh, I think with some regret that you should be able to speak in favour of extreme violence in the abstract. No, not with any regret. You should have the right to speak in favour of extreme violence. Now, when I, uh, when I was your age, or rather when I was an undergraduate, there was an organisation at my university and at most universities in this country called the Irish Solidarity Campaign, a group of beastly IRA scumbag people. And they would always turn up to union meetings and speak about the um, and speak about the war against British colonialism and, and the death in custody of political prisoners or prisoners of war. And my blood would boil at watching these people. But I never for a moment thought that they should be chased off campus or that they should be put in prison for saying what they thought. And I, I do suggest that the IRA insurrection of the 1970s and 80s was a much greater existential threat to this country than anything done by excitable youths in Bradford or Leicester. Um, th these people's violent propensities seem to be directed towards one side or the other in a foreign civil war. The IRA supporters in this country wanted to break up the United Kingdom. They wanted to unite part of the United Kingdom to a foreign country and bring about um, a Marxist revolution in those two joined countries. Indeed, they probably wanted to bring down um, our own system of government. The Irish Solidarity Campaign was a much greater existential threat to this country than Islam for UK or any of the other organisations with which Anjum Chowdhury may be associated. Yeah, I just wanted to problematize the distinction between speech and fundraising a little bit, um, because most speech in the modern world, at least for most advocacy, requires some expenditure of funds. If you want to print out pamphlets or on the website or produce videos, uh, like how different is that from fundraising on someone's behalf? Um, you would. You'd apply the rules of criminal liability to this. Let's suppose that you want to run a blog um, which upholds the right of violent jihad against the unbelievers. Then yes, yes, you should have the right to raise funds and you should have the right to run your blog arguing for violent jihad against the unbelievers. If, on the other hand, your blog then starts an appeal to buy Semtex for, for young persons to blow themselves up in the Leicester Central branch of Starbucks, well, then Inspector Plodge should come and start asking a few questions. But, you know, there are grey areas all around that, so that's just the general rule. Okay, Peter? I'm just in, you, at the beginning, you said uh, things have got to such a bad situation that academics are being asked to sit in on these discussions. Mm -hmm. to be sure <laughs> that I am not that person. <laughs> <laughs> I am academic here, but that, on the contrary, I'm here, part of because I'm uh, uh, um, in support of free speech and particularly mm -hmm. concerned about the condition of it at the London School of Economics, which is probably uh, one of the recent primes to be worse than most of them from that point of view. Um, and Peter asked me to, amongst other people, asked if I would chair the meeting uh, because the uh, school had uh, asked him that he should get an external academic to chair the meeting. Mm. And I refused, saying I didn't think it was because I believe in free speech, I shouldn't be regulating the old school, which I would be you know, as the academic policeman in that mm. situation. Uh, and I was at a meeting, I'm coming to her question, I was at a meeting uh, discussion for university administrators about the prevent strategy. Uh, at which a vice chancellor of a London university said, Oh, I, I don't want to do this speech. I don't want to be able to say what they want on my campus uh, because I want them to say it on my campus 
I don't want them going back to Wembley or Whitechapel and talking about it there. I'd much rather they be talking about it on my campus where I know who's saying what, you know, in the circumstances that I can manage or something like that. And similarly, the LSE seems concerned that even, even a meeting like this, but certainly a meeting that might involve uh, ideas in Jihad and I, mm. um, is um, it's not so much they, don't, they want to stop people saying things, but they want to control the form in which it's said, there needs to be balance, a neutral chair, mm. and, you know, and all that. So I wonder what you, what you thought about that, that it's not so much a, a negative, repressive mm. intervention, it's a regulative, um, enabling kind of intervention that, that I think is imaginable for that strategy, yeah. whether that's a problem. Okay. Well, well for the avoidance of doubt, um, although I have no right to determine who is present at this meeting, I regard your presence here as both welcome and friendly. And um, I do wear more than one hat. I am the director of the Libertarian Alliance, and I am also, in some respects, an educator. And I'm aware of, not necessarily of legal requirements as yet, but I'm aware of very strong administrative pressures on me to monitor and to record certain utterances or certain likely utterances by my students and to make these available to my superiors. So uh, this has been a requirement in my sector for, for many years now and so far it has been regarded as a mildly scandalous joke. Um, it, it, it has been largely ignored, but um, the, the insistence is becoming more pressing. And, and sooner or later, I, I can see that I shall be pushed to the point where if I'm standing in a lecture room waiting for people to finish coming in, and I hear a certain conversation behind me, I shall have to turn and say, would you please desist from this line of conversation, otherwise I shall be legally required to report you to the, to the administration of our institution. Now, we are not there yet, but I can see that we are moving in that direction. I, I can also see, I'm also aware of all of these requirements to promote British values and to argue against the various kinds of heresy or dissent from these British values it is all deplorable, and so far I and my colleagues have done the absolute minimum, but I can see that as with the progress of the money laundering regulations, minimal compliance, i.e. non-compliance, will be gradually phased out, and full and indeed over-compliance will soon become the norm, at which point I and many other people will need to reconsider our um, positions. Yeah. Um, kind of a joint question, you're saying, if you're working in your position, quite simply, that you care about freedom of speech, concern about it on campus, and with regard to the specific example you gave, where you say you feel we're moving in a direction whereby you may overhear a conversation and be obliged to report it. Um, the question is, what should academics be doing? What do they want to do? Um, <laughs> what should academics be doing in order to, to improve the free speech environment, particularly on campus, particularly on campuses in general, um, with regard to LSE in particular, but with, uh, with regard to campuses in general? And uh, are there any hesitations which academics may have to speaking out against uh, a lack of free speech or speaking to uh, improve the environment of free speech on campus. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Do you, do you feel academics have anything that they... There's, there are things academics should be doing in order to improve the state of free speech on campuses. Yes, of course there are, but you see, we all have jobs and pensions to think about, and, and even if jobs and pensions are not at stake, we have reputations and friendships to think about. And... 
Am I really going to stick my neck out in defence? Am I going to stick my professional neck out in defence of somebody who may be mentally unbalanced, may not be a very nice person, whose opinions I personally may find disagreeable, and whom under normal circumstances I'd walk by on the other side of the street? It really does come down to that. The, the problem with restrictions on freedom of speech is that the people who are caught by those uh, are, are usually, in the general sense, undesirables. You see, all other people shut up when the laws come in. It's the undesirables who stand up uh, and give spit, spittle flecked speeches in defence of whatever has been banned. I believe you just said that. Come on. No, no, I am saying that. <laughs> Look, if it were to, let me think. Um, I don't believe. I believe that global. I believe that most claims about anthropogenic global warming are lies put out in defence of well-funded special interest groups, which includes um, official bodies. I can say that because there is no law against saying that. If we were to have a climate change denial or hate speech law, I would shut up about it. I would just think it isn't true, but I'm not going to say it. The people left arguing against the consensus position would be the people who at the moment are regarded as a bit strange. You see, that, that, that is what happens with censorship. If you are an anti-censorship advocate, you are repeatedly obliged to defend people who, whose presence at any meeting is an embarrassment. Look, back in the, back in the 1950s and 60s, most of the people standing up and saying, I'm a homosexual and I believe in rights for homosexuals, were what's called, you know, they were people of rather ill repute. The, the, the great mass of uh, the great mass of shop assistants and assistant librarians and parking wardens who, who might have had an inclination to all male sex, they just kept their heads down. And uh, if you criminalise any thing that shouldn't be criminalised, if you criminalise any opinion, the people left standing in defence of it are the oddballs, and that's what is partly so bad about it. I think there's two, I'll come back to, to what Steve said, I think there's two ways of, of splitting it. One is to think about what academics should do in relation to the university, what we do, and the other is what we should do in relation to what students do. And that's my, in a way that's trickier because my, when, when the, somebody may remember the atheist t-shirt round yeah. that was given mm -hmm. to that one, and, um, the I don't know if you, the two atheists, there was an atheist society, student society, and they had Jesus and Mo t shirts, which offended the diversity of right. student yeah. university officers, so she got them kicked out and they were threatened. Well, she got them kicked out of the freshest fair, but then they were threatened, seriously threatened, by the university administration. Now, at that point, I didn't intervene, but should have done. Now, I thought at that moment I should have written a letter to the school secretary saying, This is a mistake, you should be doing this, back off, which they did eventually because it was a mistake. But then a year later, around comes homophobia, the rugby and homophobia, and also the, the, the whole round of the rugby homophobia. Movement. And there, I'm forced now, because it's a much bigger deal, to be to speak up for uh, um, people who I don't have yeah, any yeah. sympathy for at all. You know, I just have no sympathy for them. Um, so then, I'll, and in fact, tactically, I would have been wiser to intervene very publicly where I did have some sympathy with the atheists, uh, because then uh, I'm stuck, as a number of us were in the law department fighting and then having an argument about policy. Now again, insofar as it's something that happens in the student union, um, my view is we should have nothing to do with it because students should organise their own political life, their own discussions, their own, that should be, and we shouldn't be policing it. Um, but once it became a question of what the school was going to do, then it becomes a matter of my responsibility. And there I think that policy was a disaster and became the reasons why uh, um, there were only 10 of us uh, and um, you know, the, the administration um, didn't take a lot of interest. But uh, I mean, to some interest, we've got a little, you know, thanks to the Lord Department, we're, we don't need to bother. 
difference between what you do is in student life and, and because we shouldn't be doing that. Well, that's difficult. I had that problem with Peter. I'm thinking, I'm here because I thought, well, I want a meeting on free speech to happen. Even if I don't agree with everything you say, I want you to go. You know, that's the point. But uh, I don't want to make it happen by being the policeman. Mm. You, so that's that's the that's the tricky thing. But I agree with John that that was exactly how our experience mm. was that because I didn't actually say anything on the atheists. I ended up having to pile in on people like I really didn't agree with, but you've got to do it. And that was difficult. You know, the truth is that in the law department, very few. People, I know of quite a few people, mm. academics who were sympathetic, but weren't willing to put their heads up. So, that's really yeah. that, so that's one of the second thing that perhaps is a question for you as well. It does seem to me, I agree with you, there's a cultural fear, but it seems to be driven by weakness. The whole thing is driven by weakness. The, the, the campaign for censorship is in itself driven by an, un, an incapacity to make the argument. It's only people who can't make the argument against homophobia or sexism or racism or whatever it is mm. who want to ban the speech they disagree with. So it's driven by an, a weakness. So if you think if you're willing to stand up and and mock it and set it up and show its voice, you know, um, it is possible. Um, but that's like any job could be. The only way to control it is to do what we can actually do. Yes. Whether we can raise views on that question. Mm. But to, to to get up and fight. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But none of us, saying. none of us is Peter Tatchell. Um, <laughs> You know, if, if there was the slightest chance that a uh, security person would burst into this room uh, and manhandle me out or off the university premises and kick me in, onto the pavement, I, I would simply not have been here tonight. I, I feel there is a slightest chance of that. Mm. It's been AC. Come on, Nate. I'm sure even OSC would love to have. No. But the, the, the point is that. Well, can I just before? I mean, that is more or less what happened to the atheist students, which we did. They were yeah. uh, they were removed from this precious fair yeah, by right. security, mm. and all that stuff was thrown over the floor. Yeah. So, mm. so, you know, it's not beyond. Uh, no, I'm not willing to do anything that involves the possibility of a violent response to me. Also, um, another point worth considering is that. Um, we do have these disclosure and bar, barring service checks nowadays, and I have an absolutely clean one. I have never been convicted, I've never been charged, I've never been arrested or cautioned, I've never been spoken to adversely by the police. Uh, and the thought of the police would come and drag me out of the room and uh, dress me down for having said um, undesirable things fills me with professional dread. I just can't afford to do it. And so cowardice does come into this. To stand up to people demanding censorship requires a great deal more courage than I've ever shown. I, I will stand up to them, but only because they are not yet sufficiently powerful to shut down the mere expression of a belief in freedom of speech. But I do feel we're moving towards that. And um do you have any advice as to what we as students can do? Because obviously we're generally, I guess we do have our university places to think about, but it's not quite the same thing in terms of jobs and pensions, which you mentioned. Um, you might know there's recently been a free speech society set up here. Um, you know, would it be, is it a good idea for us, for, for us to um, you know, invite people as a kind of provocative thing um, to challenge these people or, or should we simply set out the arguments for freedom of speech? I think the matter. Um, let's think of the most... Let, let, okay, what you could do is set up a freedom of speech society and you could run a series of events in which you invited people like Anjum Chowdhury, David Irving... <laughs> um, <laughs> Is, is no, it's a suggestion, right? <laughs> is Myra Hindley still alive? Dennis Nielsen, he's still alive. You could try to get him to speak by a video link of some kind. <laughs> no, you could do that. You'd get acres of newspaper publicity and you get the BBC. But it really wouldn't do, it wouldn't do you much good. Um, I'm afraid the best any of us can do at the moment is to put the case against censorship in the abstract and to try to counter specific demands for censorship. 
Um, that may work in the long term, I don't know, but I would certainly never suggest that other people should go out of the way to do the things that I would be frightened to do myself. Uh, all political movements of any kind are filled with what somebody once called the why don't you merchants. Why don't you chain yourself to the railings of 10 down the street and swallow the key? Uh, you know, this would really raise the profile of our cause. Oh no, I'm not doing it, but you, know, you do it, you do it. No, no. I'm not a why don't you merchant. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put myself into serious trouble. I don't expect you to do so. We've got time for a couple more questions. Anything else to say? I've got I've got one more question myself now. Uh, yeah, in your speech you you said about how um, the kind of the kind of mentality of censorship um, from people who have sort of they they kind of rely on the government to restrict things which they um, they think I think you use the example of fat people and they think oh I can't be do I can't deal with people you know making jokes or whatever about being fat therefore we should go to the government to um, make some hate speech law do you think that's kind of um, part of a broader kind of growing status mentality in society that we rely on the government to basically solve our problems yes um... What I would say generally, however, is that there never has been a time in this country or in any other where freedom of expression was generally respected. Um, there are certain things you cannot easily say today which you could say 50 years ago. Equally, there were many things 50 years ago you couldn't talk about that you can nowadays, or, or indeed that you are nowadays required to say. Uh, and so, um, to say that there is a rising tide of intolerance may be true, but, but on the other hand, it may be an optical illusion. You don't see how restrictive speech was in the past. Indeed, um, he, he, here is a point which is worth considering. There are nowadays many laws, there are many laws uh, against expressing certain opinions. There are also what amount to laws, though they're not written as such on the statute book, and these are all utterly deplorable. At the same time, although you were perfectly at liberty 40 years ago, 40, 50, 30, 25 years ago to say these things, nobody was able to listen to you when you said them, whereas nowadays uh, anybody can have an audience of millions. You don't have to send an article off to a newspaper and expect it to be put into a bin or published if at all ruthlessly butchered. You don't have to beg somebody to publish a letter in a newspaper or try to turn up in front of television cameras with a banner saying um, George Davis is innocent to go back to a time when I was rather young. Nowadays you just start your blog or start your Twitter feed or open your Facebook account and you can, you can go viral. Uh, and so although there are, or, although we live in a, in a more repressive environment in the legal and administrative sense, in, in practical terms, we have greater freedom of speech today than we've ever had in my lifetime and maybe at any time in history. Okay, any final points? Okay, well, well um, please join me in thanking uh, Sean Gar for coming to us. Thank you very much. And thank you. Very much.